families and communities and so on. So there will be specific government programs there that will be introduced, enhance what is working, introduce new programs that will care for the soul of the Philippine of the family, all the families of the world. And then number three, make sure that there's a better fit uh, between what Filipinos have skills and what can be found abroad. Uh, for example, uh, you know, you know all the phenomena of medical doctors training as nurses because the demand is for nurses. And there's some teachers or college graduates who are ending up as domestic helpers. So kind of try to match Uno in terms of where the quality of life is. But in the end, to ensure that there are, because I think some of the Filipinos are forced to go abroad because of economic reasons. If we have a vibrant economy, develop sustainable investments here, really crack out this economy after we get rid of capital corruption, decrease poverty, I think this is going to be a very interesting place to live in. And we have, because we have other attractions aside from just economic, we have a beautiful land, beautiful people, friendly people. That's why a lot of of our W's are homesick. We should not develop a disincentive for them to actually stay here. Would your experience in microfinance help with this uh, OFW funds? Yeah, uh, definitely, but our experience was that uh, the, micro, uh, the OFW families don't need microfinance. <laughs> but I'm glad you asked the question, Noni, because one of the more important things is that we will encourage OFW remittances to be spent more productively and not just in terms of consumption. In other words, especially a kind of consumption that doesn't really need to further investment, further empowering of the family. So the infrastructure to put in place this, this kind of uh, uh, investment possibilities for OFWs, aside of course from the direct help of the family. We found that because our microfinance operation deals with any investment anywhere from 3,000 to 50,000, uh, OFW money can come in at the rate of 50,000 a month or more. So the, the help is not really needed there, but in large scale, larger scale, small, uh, and even medium scale uh, enterprises. But it will prevent some from leaving, right? If you are giving them microfinance stop them from poverty. Yes, uh, but if you're handling uh, a big family, it will not be enough. In fact, uh, one of the realizations in microfinance uh, is that the microfinance industry as a whole has helped to modulate, to, uh, to prevent, to buffer against um, sudden uh, problems of lack of cash flow. But in terms of removing from poverty, it's been a slow process. That's why part of my platform has been to introduce the concept of strategic microfinance, which means to say we want people to graduate to have higher levels of loan assistance, to higher levels of capitalization, using technologies that are dormant in the state colleges and universities that are not being used, but can be used to, for the benefit of the countryside. To cite just one example, there's a, there's a huge debate in this country in the use of genetically engineered soybeans. We're importing a lot of genetically engineered soybeans from the United States. But we also have a technology that can produce bone bean soy uh, sauce equally as good as soybeans using native mungo. Then it's a potential multi-billion peso industry that can be spread out into the countryside if it's properly done and managed. So that's what I meant to say. We scale up in terms of enterprises that could have thousands, potentially even millions of potential impact. Imagine substituting the whole, the whole soy sauce industry using soybeans, which is then require the use of local resources instead of soybeans imported from the United States or China or Latin America. This is what I need to say, strategic microfinance. It's a very good idea because uh, yeah. I've been encountering microfinance for the, since 1980, right. and it seems like it's not really taking off in a larger scale. It's it's this no, it's actually taking off in terms of numbers. numbers. We have three to four million now uh, receiving microfinance assistance, but the graduation from poverty right. is That's lower. Right. This, this is what we have to speed up mm -hmm. 
by having uh, larger flows of uh, capitalization uh, for new enterprises by the people, by the book. Um, we have here a question from Raisa, she's a writer. What new thing will you do with Muslim autonomy and the long pending agreement with the MILF? I yes. think I've asked this before, but uh, for the sake of the audience. Yes, uh, I'm a proponent for renegotiating the so called MOA, the Memorandum of Agreement on Assessed of Domain uh, between the government of the Philippines and the MILF. But I would do it in a new context and in a very different context. Number one, uh, even before the renegotiation starts, or, and then during what is happening, there would be already a reallocation of the resources of the Philippine government to arm to redress the historical imbalance of social services in arm. Arm has the highest poverty rate, the lowest number of roads, the lowest number of electricity, the lower number of hospitals. I mean, arm is suffering from a neglect. And meanwhile, when well, that was going on, of course, the government uh, held Ampatuan with all of its private authorities going on. That policy will not exist in my administration. People put in office. So we have to demonstrate the will of the government to address historical issues as well as social justice issues from the start. And that is a credible basis to negotiate, both with the MILF and the MDF that there is this political deal of more men to address serious structural injustice. Starting the negotiation, I would request both parties, including the government in this case and MILF, to do massive consultations among the, the Muslim part and, uh, of course, the Christian uh, government side because the original agreement was secretive. And so all kinds of misunderstanding arose out of it relative knowledge, plus some distortions in the media, and so on. So it has to be an open process, it is um, transparent, and then come up with an agreement. But it is clear that the conflict in Mindanao is not a religious conflict, it is really a conflict in, that's connected to social injustice as well as land issues. And I think um, it's possible to solve the problem. The third, the third thing that I would require, better clarification, is what would be the connection of a Bangsamoro bans juridical entity with the central national government that has to be specified quite clearly. It was not specified in the original uh, memorandum of agreement. So in short, I'm open uh, with new conditions to ensure that we achieve lasting peace by addressing real concerns that people of Mindanao, especially Muslim brothers and sisters, yeah. Very good, very clear cut. I mean, others would be. But what would you think is the number of years it will take to solve this? Uh, you know, I think, uh, I don't know, I don't want to be presumptuous. Yes. <laughs> but I think if this done properly, two years is already too long. Too long, pardon? Too long, too long. Too long. Too long. Too long. Okay. process. Two years is already a long time. So this will be solved within two years. Because I've spoken to both sides of the, the MILF side and the government side that were involved in the negotiation. Uh, there's a meeting of minds on so many areas. And part of the misinterpretation, and this is what I want to also correct here, is that the Pansamoro political entity is not going to be a new nation state. It will still coexist within the broad framework of the nation state of the Republic of the Philippines. This is one of the uh, misperceptions that they're creating a state within the state. There will have to be autonomy, self-sovereign, self-rule, as already provided for in the Constitution, in the creation of the autonomous regions of the Philippines. It's already part there. It just has to be implemented and structured in such a way that there will be a meaningful integration and harmonization of interests between the Bansamoro people and the, national, and the Filipino people as a whole. But what about warlordism? Um, yes. Is it, 